Hey folks, it's Nate. Thanks for joining me at the art table again today. We are back with another indie comic review, which will be the last for at least a little while because uh, this is the end of the Comics Fairy's Blessings from this month. The Plot Holes by Sean Murphy, also known as Sean Gordon Murphy, uh, in times past when he's written for DC and Marvel. Um, and as you can guess, this is not quite as much of an indie comic as some of the other ones I've looked at, because Sean Murphy has worked in the mainstream quite a bit. However, he did publish this independently on his own using crowdfunding, and I think it's interesting to look at the works of people who have worked in the mainstream industry versus those who are outside of the mainstream. There's some interesting things to see there. There are some interesting contrasts, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But first, as always, let's talk about the form factor of the book. It's a really nice book. I don't know who printed it. I don't know if it was U.S. or overseas, but they did a good job. It's got a perfect bound spine, i.e. using the adhesive perfect, not that it is perfect. But uh, it's good quality paper, uh, good quality cover. It's a little glossy on the interior, and people who have uh, watched this channel for a long time know that I'm not a fan of a high gloss. I think it makes the book a little too hard to read. It can be difficult to appreciate the art fully. Um, this is not a very high gloss. It's it's probably a medium gloss, which is still a little bit um, against my taste, but it does not impact the reading as much as, say, a magazine-level gloss would. Uh, so, I don't know. It This is a, a personal thing that's going to be to taste. It did not really impact my enjoyment of the book too much. Um, but I did find it was better to read it in indirect lighting than under uh, a lamp immediately next to you, as you might see where I'm sitting right now. So um, these are these are things to taste, but the quality of all of the work is very good. Uh, I should address one of the elephants in the room, and that is the way it was shipped. Uh, my copy came in pretty good shape. It has a little bit of a bend in the corner here. Not really a big deal. Uh, but it was shipped in a box that was really quite too large for it, probably about two inches larger than the book itself each way. Um, and the box contained basically some craft paper that was crumpled up in there. Did not do the best job of uh, keeping it from getting jostled around. And it was uh, just in a bag, I believe. Um, it's been a while since this arrived, so I don't remember. Uh, and I didn't keep all the packaging because who has the space for that? Um, obviously, the thing that everyone has said about this book uh, bears reiteration. It would have arrived in much better condition if it was shipped in a Gemini mailer. And while it is a pretty chonky book, um, it is quite thick, uh, which is a point in the book's favor. Uh, it is still uh, the right size to fit in a Gemini mailer. I was a little bit uncertain when it first arrived because it did arrive uh, in, bag, in uh, such large packaging. But I did get a Gemini mailer when Earthbound Part 2 arrived a couple of days later, and I was able to very easily fit this book into that Gemini. So uh, clearly that's uh, hopefully for future reference on future campaigns. Murphy and his team will use those instead of packaging in larger boxes. And uh, in my experience, shipping in smaller boxes can save you some money, although under a certain size, uh, you really don't see a whole lot of price variation. So perhaps he would have saved on packaging per, uh, or on shipping, perhaps not. Certainly, I would think he would save some on packaging because he wouldn't need to put the book in with craft paper as padding. Uh, so he would save on that. And I don't know how much the boxes he used cost, but they're larger than Gemini. So you would think at least the materials would be cheaper and it would cost slightly less. And when you have a large volume of books to ship, and I believe uh, the plot holes did... Uh, at least a few thousand copies, you know, you are going to see even a couple of cents savings stack up over a campaign of that size. So all in all, uh, not the best shipping. I know a lot of people have requested and received replacements. Um, I haven't because, like I said, it arrived in pretty good shape. Um, just uh, a couple of pages here at the beginning that were bent up a little bit. Um, not something that I plan to worry about. I tend to reread uh, most of my books, so the corners are going to get bent anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, I will just put this book on my shelf and uh, call it good. Let's talk about the art. Sean Gordon Murphy is a great artist. Everything in here is good. I mean, it. Um, I, I really... 
the only the only criticism I can offer is that um, the editor, one of one of the characters in here, uh, her face, you can you can see her actually on the cover here. Um, her face looks a little strange in some panels, um, specifically panels with heavy shadow. Uh, she is an older woman, um, and in his attempts to uh, display a wrinkled face for her, um, you sometimes, as you see in this panel right here, maybe, I don't know how clear that is, um, but she looks more like she has a stone face that is cracking uh, than a human face that is wrinkling. And um, I don't know if that's a result of Murphy's technique or um, his, his choice of materials to work with in terms of pen nibs and stuff like that, or if he just maybe needed to do um, more studies of an older woman's face to really get this right. But uh, the wrinkles never look right. Um, the expressions uh, don't seem to um, change the face in a way that is very natural. And, you know, I'm not terribly surprised about that. There are very rarely older characters, and uh, particularly older female characters, um, in comics. And he may just not have had a lot of experience working with this particular type of face. Uh, regardless, I did often find her expressions uh, and the look of her face uh, a little unnatural. And maybe, maybe more studies would have been called for there. Otherwise, it's fantastic art. It's really great. He has a great command of character design. He has a great command of panel layout. Uh, he has a great command of action. He has a great command of dialogue. And, I mean, lay, laying out the dialogue and things like that. I have no criticisms beyond Ed's face. It doesn't really look like a human face. It looks more like a mask with lines drawn on it, which is not ideal. But, again, I understand this is... This is not the kind of face comic artists do very often, uh, and maybe Murphy would have benefited from doing some more studies there. Uh, but other than that, what can I say? He's, he's a brilliant artist. He has brilliant technique, and it shines through in this book. Let's talk about the story. Murphy is uh, a very experienced storyteller. He has done uh, comics through Image. He has done comics through, I believe... Marvel, actually. I'm not sure if he's worked for Marvel at all off the top of my head, um, but it would not surprise me at all. And of course, uh, he's worked for DC, most famously with the Batman White Knight franchise, which is, I believe, going into its third miniseries. And he clearly knows how to tell a story. Uh, the thing I was wondering about going into this was how good would he do at editing the story, which is a very interesting question given the context of the plot holes um the premise of the plot holes is pretty straightforward there exists a computer program that creates well accepts submissions from authors um, edits them so that they can be published and then publishes them and the plot holes are an interesting combination of people um their leader the editor is or just ed for short is a woman who spent years as an editor in the publishing industry and has been entrapped by this computer program through circumstances that are explained to us over the course of the story i won't spoil those um i did find ed's character arc to be one of the most interesting um but uh she is been pulled into this program and she has selected a number of characters from um, stories that were not able to be salvaged and published to assist her in her duties. She refers to these people as the plot holes, hence the name of the book. And it's an interesting story. It's a very, very meta story. Um, it has a lot to say about um, storytelling and how you write characters and free will and archetypes. And it's pretty entertaining. Um, there's a lot of great visual storytelling in here, as you would expect from Murphy. And then there is a heartfelt attempt to talk about ideas like um, free will and what it means to be a character in a story and 
there are a lot of interesting philosophical questions there that most authors think about at least a little bit at some point in their writing career, usually fairly, fairly early in it. And I, I guess that is my first criticism for this story. It feels a little juvenile. Most authors who write anything uh, think about the ideas that are in this story. And I know that for audiences in general, uh, there are not as many authors as there are people in a typical audience. That's a pretty good rule of thumb for anything. There are not as many carpenters as there are people who sit on chairs. Um, and so I looked at this very differently from the typical reader because I saw a lot of stuff here that I talked about in college uh, with other writers and that I pondered a little bit when I was uh, an author and then I really stopped thinking about uh, in pursuit of good storytelling uh, because while the characters in your story are very important uh, and I still engage with a lot of the characters that I write as people who present themselves to me as opposed to things that I create, um, the stories themselves are, uh, are a part of me as opposed to uh, part of the characters. Um, I cast characters in stories rather than um, creating characters for stories, if you will. And that is kind of one of the ways I have, a, as an author, have um, resolved these questions. And it was interesting to read a story from another author looking at these questions, but it wasn't, it wasn't really engaging because a lot of these questions were already settled for me. And I don't know how general audiences are going to engage with them because a lot of general audiences don't think about these questions at all. And the reality is, I think that um, it's better not to engage with those questions uh, if you don't plan on answering them yourself and then creating something. It is better to uh, accept a creation on its own merits than to um, try and force them into a philosophy of how storytelling should go um, for the most part. And, and Murphy is really, it looks like he's trying to put forward an idea about storytelling and story editing, which is important, uh, important part of the narrative, um, that he thinks is good, which is fine. Uh, you can definitely write books like this. I don't know if I really recommend reading them. I think the best story of this type that I have read or watched is actually Stranger Than Fiction which is a, a brilliant meta-commentary on the author and the character. And uh, if that's what you want, um, if you want that meta-commentary, I would, I would watch that film over reading the plot holes. But that is not all the plot holes is. The plot holes is also a raucous, genre-spanning adventure story. And in that, I think it succeeds a lot better than it does as a meta-commentary. So you have these people whose jobs is to save stories uh, by editing them, and they have a bunch of uh, technology that lets them hop from story to story. And we are introduced to this through the point of view of Ink Slayer, who is this character here on the front, and is probably a little bit of a self-insert of Sean Murphy, which is not surprising given... Uh, the kind of story it is, and honestly doesn't bother me a whole lot. I don't know a lot about Sean Murphy, and I don't know um, a lot about his uh, uh, his life or the way he has approached um, comics, so I don't know how much of Ink Slayer's uh, perspective on the industry is just uh, him being a mouthpiece for Murphy. And that makes it a lot easier for me to just look at Ink Slayer as himself. And I should note that Ink Slayer, although pro probably a self-insert, uh, is not an over-glorified uh, Gary Stu kind of self-insert. He's really pretty lame. 
at the beginning, as all good heroic characters should be. And he grows into a role, a specific role, uh, that is an important part of his finding his place among the plot holes and in expounding on all of the characters in the plot holes to us. In many ways, um, Ink Slayer is a part of the story because he draws out the other characters and helps us as the readers to understand them. And that's not surprising. He is a new member added to the roster of the plot holes, and we see them all through his eyes. Uh, he is, um, and we come to understand this editing system through his eyes. He is not just an author insert, but he is an audience insert to help us understand what is going on. And he plays a little bit on the universal storytelling instinct in humans. All people want to tell stories and share them with each other. That's why when you see a friend you haven't seen for a couple of weeks, you bring him up to date on all the things that have happened in your life. Um, that's the storytelling instinct. That's how we share our experiences with each other. And I think Inkslayer, as a stand-in for that, is also very effective. And I think the fact that he is um, a good heroic character who has to build up himself and his skills and find his place in the world, and the fact that he is not just an author insert, but also an audience insert to help us understand the story and to speak to our um, universal human desire to share stories and experiences with each other, that makes him uh, a very good and um, useful protagonist in a story. Uh, I don't think he's great. I don't think he's so memorable that I will be using him as a reference point for storytelling in the future, but I think he is well-written and well-constructed and well-conceived to function in the plot holes as a story. Um, and the story is pretty interesting. Uh, Ed took a villain from a failing comic book series and gave him the opportunity to redeem himself um, by assisting in saving worlds as a member of the plot holes. He goes rogue from the plot holes and they have to track him down. Inkslayer is brought in to fill his place in the team, but he doesn't have superpowers. He's not a genius um, technological innovator like this uh, supervillain was. And he feels very out of place. And yet, as they pursue Surge, which is the supervillain's name, through various worlds, and they begin seeing the damage he does, and they begin constructing countermeasures to him, Inkslayer begins to understand not just um, how the narratives are shaping up and how he can exercise those, but how he can function as... Uh, as a, as a man who drew comics in the story that was told about him, he learns how he can function as a sort of story doctor or a script doctor to make it easier for the plot holes to solve problems in stories while also pursuing Surge. And that's a very interesting story arc. Um, if you are, particularly if you are used to the editing process and everything that entails, um, it's kind of interesting to see some of the metaphors that Murphy works in here uh, for the the struggles of getting a story right. I think that the biggest hurdle this story is going to face is that it is it is a great adventure story with a protagonist who uh, grows to meet the challenge, and that's very good. But it's so meta. It is so meta. Uh, people are going to have a very hard time um, moving, looking past those elements to the, the simple heartfelt adventure that I think is the strongest part of the plot holes. And I think that, I think that Murphy would have been better off focusing on one side or the other. Tell a simple adventure story or tell a really meta story about the difficulties of the process and reconciling author and created work. Um, something like Stranger Than Fiction, which again is, I think, the best meta commentary on that I have ever seen. As it is, if you want a uh, world-spanning adventure, 
The plot holes is pretty good. I don't think it's to the best one I've ever read. That's obviously Tsubasa Reservoir Chronicle. Um, but it's it's good. And unlike Reservoir Chronicle, it is short and concise, which is its own upside. There's not uh, a ton of deep lore here that you're going to have to learn and then remember in order for the story to function. Uh, Reservoir Chronicle has all of that and it uses it brilliantly, but uh, not everyone has the time or the, the brain space um, to get all of that and hold it in your head while you are reading this long convoluted story. And while you can get a, a huge impact if you use that correctly, um, the plot holes has a pretty satisfying and insightful ending. Um, I feel that Murphy leans a little bit too he heavy on um, some aspects of the, the conclusion. He wants to make it clear we get all of the points he's trying to make. I would have preferred if he had left them a little more ambiguous. But otherwise, um, it's a heartfelt story about adventure and the adventure of creation. And I liked it. Um, but I think I would recommend it more to people looking for an adventure story than a meta-commentary, um, which I, I think I've already made clear. I do want to note that there are about 20 pages of making of stuff, which is really, really cool at the end here. Like uh, the, the plot holes have a, a um, ship they use to hop around from book to book on the bookshelf uh, as they edit them. It's called uh, the footnote. And... Murphy built an actual model of it, and he's got pictures of here and uh, some talk about the process. That's really cool. Um, he shows some of his character design sketches, which is, you know, pretty normal um, for an indie book. He also shows some of his mock-ups of uh, their headquarters, and um, he's got some raw scan pages. All of this stuff is really cool and fun to look at. Um, like, he, he's got storyboards. If you're interested in how such a great and experienced artist goes about putting a story together and thinking about uh, those kind of things, there is a little bit to learn from that. It's not as extensive as something like The Making of Earthworm Jim, but it is pretty cool to look at. And if you are a comic creator, um, I don't know if I would go so far as to say buy it just for that. Uh, but if you're already interested in the story, that is a nice bonus. Um, those are my thoughts on the plot holes. It's a decent effort, and clearly um, Murphy got people who were trustworthy to look over the story and the script for him and help him um, really put it in the place. At no point is it unclear. Um, at no point is it confusing. The dialogue is good. Um, the prose is good. It's well written. Um, I think the the real hurdle for people is going to be um, the meta thematic elements and how well uh, Murphy executed on them. So that is the thing you're going to have to think about for yourself. How much meta commentary do you want in your stories? How much you know just general um, world spanning adventure do you want? And Keep in mind that the plot holes is about 50-50. If that's not the split you want, it's probably not your book. If you're okay with that split, it's worth checking out. And if you are a collector of good comic art, well, it's probably worth the buy for that alone. Because it is Sean Murphy. He is a brilliant artist. Anyways, that's all I've got for you today. If you've read the plot holes, let me know what you think about his meta-commentary in the comments below. There's a like button and a subscribe button down there you can use as you see fit. And I'll talk to you later.